Together as God's family, let us pray in the words our Savior gave us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is now. Give us this day our daily and forgive us our trespasses. O Mary, conceived without sin, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. After Jesus was baptized by St. John the Baptist, and we understand that to mean Jesus, when he went into the waters of the Jordan, baptized the waters, giving those waters power ultimately to baptize us. Of course, Jesus had no sin. You understand that Jesus, a divine person, second person of the Blessed Trinity, assumed a human nature and became like one of us in everything except sin. No sin in the Lord. Now, I'm going to read to you from the fourth chapter of the Gospel of Luke. It's a, a reading that's very appropriate for Lent. We're coming into Lent next week. After Jesus was baptized at the Jordan, Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit. Now, I'm just going to make a footnote here. Lousy translation. Jesus wasn't led by the Spirit. Jesus was driven by force, by the power of the Holy Spirit. Ekbalain, a Greek verb. If you pick up a football or a baseball and you hurl it with all your might, that's the meaning of that verb. He was hurled by force. Not against his will, nothing like that. But the power of the Holy Spirit didn't lead him. Drove him. It's like, I didn't feel like getting up this morning and coming to preach. I wasn't led by the Spirit <laughs> to do my job this morning. He drove me. Now, I don't mind that. It's good. Some of us need to be driven. You know, I might not have moved. Well, not with Jesus. No deficiencies in Jesus. No weaknesses in Jesus. But the word in the scripture, he was driven by the power of the Spirit into the desert for 40 days tempted by the devil. You remember that movie, that stupid movie, Last Temptation of Christ? I don't know who they had for a theological advisor on that thing. And don't get me started on that. But in any event, it, it, it portrayed a silly thing. Now, it says that the devil tempted Jesus for 40 days in the desert. That's correct. Hey, the Word of God says it. That's true. The devil did tempt him. Could Jesus fall into temptation? Certainly not. Certainly not. A divine person? The second person of the Blessed Trinity? Now, who falls into temptation? Persons or natures? Persons. The subject of action. Could Jesus fall into temptation? No. Could he be tempted? Yes. Why did he do it at all? Give us an example. Now, he has a human nature. That divine person acting through his human nature. It's called a theandric action. Two more Greek words. Don't, don't worry about big fancy words. Just know what they mean. Theandric action. An action of the God-man. 
two Greek words that mean God and man. So it's an action of the God-man. Jesus, a divine person acting through his human nature. So the devil tempted him. For Forty days, absolutely, the devil did tempt him. But could Jesus give in to temptation? No, absolutely not. Bad theology to say that he could. I'll ask you a question along those lines. The blessed in heaven, do they have a free will? Certainly they do. Can they sin? No, they cannot. Well, how can they be free and not sin? Because their freedom has been indeed set free. They are confirmed in grace. Well, Jesus is beyond being merely confirmed in grace. He has the grace of the hypostatic union. That's the union of the God-man, divinity and humanity, acting form. So he, he could be tempted, but he can't sin. There's a difference. A lot of people struggle with that, and they try to say, oh, well, what good is it then? You know, then he's not like me. He is like you and me in everything except sin. He became like one of us in everything except sin. He did not sin, and he could not sin. Well, then he's not free. Yes, he's consummately free. His freedom is confirmed and absolute. It's the freedom that we will have in, a, in an analogous manner of speaking in heaven. Okay, so tempted by the devil, and he ate nothing in those days. And when they were ended, he was hungry. That's the humanity part. He had a human nature. He could be hungry. He could suffer cold and heat. That's true. That's not a moral defect. That's a physical defect. Jesus had no moral defects. He had the physical limitations of humanity, but he didn't have moral limitations. The devil said to him, if you are the son of God, Command this stone to become bread. Now, let, let me, I'm going through this slowly. Now, who said that? The devil said that. Now, you remember the little story I told you this morning about the, that guy who said, uh, we don't b really believe in angels and demons. They're just literary devices used in sacred scripture to make a point. That's hogwash. Let me use that highly theological term. <laughs> Hogwash. There are angels and there are demons. Now, in the beginning, God created everything out of nothing. Ex nihilo, as we say in Latin. That's what creation means. The creator, and there's only one of them, God. The creator brought everything that is into being out of nothing. That's creation by definition, okay? And it was all good. Everything God creates is good. It has to be. It comes from his creating hand. It has to be good. The angel's good. Oh, what about the devil? Is he good? That's how he started out. Good. An angel. Then what happened? Well, you can read about it in the Catechism of the Catholic Church. It comes down to us through the tradition given to us by the doctors, fathers, and saints of the church. A plan was revealed by God to the angels. Well, the plan of the incarnation and redemption. Now, Lucifer, one of the brightest of the angels, an angel now, good, pure spiritual essence, angel denotes their mission, not their being, messengers. Angels are messengers. That very high angel, very intelligent, very bright, the word Lucifer, his name Lucifer, means light of the morning or morning star. That concerns brightness. That's analogous to light, which has to do with the intellect, which has to do with truth, which in philosophy we say is a convertible term with goodness and being itself. Very high angel, very bright, intelligent, beautiful, good. Now, Lucifer, blinded by his own light, chose darkness, rebelled at the plan of God. And the plan of God was that God would assume a created nature. God would assume a created nature. And that nature would be human. In other words, the Word 
would become flesh and dwell among us. Lucifer said, no, arrogant, no, bad plan, God, I've got a better one, you take my nature. If God's going to assume a created nature, it'll be mine, angelic. I'm the highest, the most beautiful, the best. Non serviat. I will not serve. Now, if you're smart, you can see there, you can discern the prototype of all sin. Hubris, pride, arrogance, self-centered pride. Hey, I'm the best. Don't you know? I'm the best preacher there. Are you? Hey, take mine. Or else, I'm not going to serve you. And so, as Jesus would later say, I watched Satan and a third of the angels fall from heaven. Now, I don't have much time any place I go. I don't debate with anyone. I don't argue. I don't enter into polemics. I'm just not involved with any of that. What I teach is what the Catholic Church teaches. And that is very clear. That is very objective. And that I know up one side and down the other. And I tell you, angels and demons are real. Not a mere literary device, as some who have been educated into imbecility would have you believe. Satan is real, a fallen angel. And he has many helpers, likewise fallen angels. There is a war going on between good and evil, between truth and lies. A life and death struggle, the war to end all wars, without any question now. There are many so-called intelligent, educated, they're not intelligent, but they're educated in quotation marks, who would have you believe this is pious fiction, medieval nonsense. They are dead wrong. And metaphorically speaking, should be lined up against a wall and shot for treason. In plain English, because that is false. The devil's real. Fallen angels are real. There are many lies about. Bite into them, as our first parents bit into the, the apple from that forbidden tree, and you suffer the consequences. Remember what God said in the garden? You can partake of all the trees in the garden. Human freedom is very broad. But you cannot partake of the tree in the center of the garden or even touch it lest you die. Human freedom has limits, and the limits are laid down by God. So, the truth is not something we make up as we go along. The truth is something which we receive with fidelity. It is something which we hand on with fidelity. It is not something we make up as we go along. So, the devil... Now, and when, that, when you see that, the devil, make sure that you understand this isn't merely a principle of evil. This is a real spiritual being, perverse and perverting, as the Holy Father has taught in some of his documents. You know how important this is? This is so important that the Pope spent several Wednesday audiences teaching on this. He taught in depth on this. This is part of the sacred deposit of the doctrine of the faith that I'm giving you here. If you believe it, you believe what the church believes. If you don't, you're a heretic. In plain English. And you separate yourself from the body of Christ. It's that simple. Don't do that. Now, most simple people don't do that. It is the pseudo-educated who do that. They are deceived and go about deceiving others. They are blind and leading the blind. I was interested to see that that's in the mass readings for today. The Holy Spirit always provides grist for my mill. In any event, the devil 
a fallen angel, Lucifer, Satan, tempted Jesus for those 40 days in the desert. And he said, well, he was hungry. He said, well, here, have some, turn, turn, take these stones and turn them into bread. You know, the devil had an intimation this was the Son of God here. He didn't know that absolutely. You know, Satan is not God. Only God knows all things. The devil doesn't know all things. But he is very intelligent, very clever being. He can make clever deductions, very astute. He can't predict the future. Only God knows the future. But through the clever use of things in nature, it looks like he, he knows. Uh, I can tell you that some of us who have had vocations to be religious or priests, some of us who are called to serve could tell you in all honesty that we've been persecuted from infancy in a certain way by the devil. And I can tell you without any question, he had me marked from the beginning. He tortured me from the beginning. He knew something. He didn't know it absolutely, but he's a real good estimator. Jesus said, it is written that man shall not live by bread alone. The word of God is powerful against evil. You know, you good people are the pillars of the church. You're the best we have. And as such, you owe it to yourself and to others to be filled with the word of God, rich as it is. You should be reading the Bible every day. You should be reading and studying the Catechism of the Catholic Church in conjunction with the Bible. You should be fed by the Word of God. You should be strengthened by it, healed by it, protected by it. It's powerful in this spiritual combat that we're engaged in. And so Jesus responded to the tempter with the Word of God. Now, you know, temptation is something that you've got to know about. Now, I know you know about temptation. Everybody's tempted in one way or another. I, I could title this talk, From Temptation to Sanctity. Temptation in itself is a neutral thing. It is neither good nor evil. Temptation can be used for good. What do I mean by that? Well, very simply, let's say you're tempted to some sin. Right. Everybody has a weakness. Now, some people have weaknesses in the areas of sexuality. Some people have weaknesses in oh, substance abuse, stealing, all kind of weaknesses, right? All kinds of sins. Now, the devil knows you. He knows you well. He knows your weak areas. He knows what to shoot at. And he's a very good shot. You owe it to yourself to be aware of these things. I'm going to tell you something. Like my professor, Father Rudolph, in the seminary used to say, Father Rudolph Ranaschek was from the, at that time, the country of Yugoslavia. He had been a theology professor at the University of Zagreb, and he taught in the seminary, and he was, you know, one of those old-fashioned guys. He was one of those crusty old priest who was down to earth, rough, but he was a good man. He wanted what was best for us. He would get up in the pulpit when it was his turn to preach and he'd glare out at us. And he would say, you know, I have a soul to save too, and I'm not going to lose it for any of you guys. <laughs> and then he would let us have it. He was a, he was a professor of moral theology and a good one. In other words, folks, I'm not going to hell for any of you. I love you, but I ain't going to hell for you. You know how priests go to hell? Not always for what they do, but for what we fail to do. It can be uncomfortable. Now, through a special grace, it's not uncomfortable for me because I rather enjoy it. But I can see how it could be uncomfortable for some to say things that people don't like to hear. 
You know, nobody likes to, to, to hear morally uncomfortable things. You know, we don't preach on a lot of stuff. Because we don't want to make people uncomfortable because we got uncomfortable. Hey, you know, the people get uncomfortable. I could never be a parish priest. I think they are great heroes. But I, I, I could, God doesn't trust me enough to ever make me a parish priest. Just that he doesn't trust me enough to let me be a parent. You know, that's why he called me to what he called me to. I come in, do my thing and get out. Because it's hard to hit a moving target. <laughs> the poor parish priest has to stay there day in and day out, week in after week, month after month. Yeah, I, I come in, rile things up, and then he's got to deal with it the rest of the time. Well, that, that's a very traditional thing in the church. Mission preachers have always done that. Nothing new about that. But, you know, in the little time that I have been in parish, there's only really one parish I ever spend any time in, my own home parish where I grew up. I'd work there summers in between semesters at university. And, oh, I galled the people no end. Some, they just couldn't stand me. Because I talked about stuff most people won't talk about. You know, it's always struck me as logical, and it's also biblical, that we need to address problematic things. If you go to the doctor, and you have a cancerous tumor on your liver and the doctor examines you he knows the tumor's there but he says my what bright eyes you have your feet are in great shape you have nice shiny hair well he says that to some <laughs> you wouldn't think much of that doctor hey my liver's sick or my heart or whatever it is a doctor addresses the parts that are ill, that are sick, that need healing. If I say, oh, you're okay, I'm okay, how wonderful you are, am I doing you any favor? No, I'm, I might be confirming you in your sins. And that is neither pastoral, merciful, nor charitable. That is indifferent at best, cowardly at worst. Not good. If you've got a moral problem, someone should tell you about it, at least in general, you know. Oh, but I don't see anything wrong with abortion under certain circumstances. Shouldn't a woman have a right to choose? You know, in all of language, we usually finish the sentence, except in that case. Right to choose what? Do we have a right to choose? Choose what? Certainly. Should we have a right to choose from among innumerable goods? Certainly. You have the right to choose to go to a basketball game this afternoon or to come here. There's nothing wrong with that. That's a legitimate choice. You have a legitimate choice whether you drive a Ford or a Toyota. You have that choice. Do you have the right to choose evil? No, you do not. Does anyone have the moral right to do wrong? No. Physically, I can climb up on top of the church, jump off and kill myself. 
Do I have the ability to do that? Yes. Do I have the moral right or ability to do that? No. Do I have free will? Yes. Good, evil. I could choose good or evil, correct? Yes. What's the moral choice? Only one, good. Does anyone have a right to choose evil? No. And the logic is very simple. Yes, but if it's good for me, you know, I, you don't have to do it. All right, fine. I'm looking out here and somebody scowling at me, doesn't like what I have to say. I reach under here, take out my 45, and I'm a good shot, and I blast them. Don't I have a right to choose what I want to do? After all, it is a free country. And you say absurd. Of course not. You can't do that. You see, we have a right to choose from a, among goods. We have freedom, but don't confuse it with license. Freedom, yes. License, no. And so Jesus was tempted. The Lord responded. The word of God. Man doesn't live by bread alone. And then the devil took him up and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And he said to him, to you, I will give all this authority and glory, for it has been delivered over to me, and I can give it to whomever I will. And I wonder if for once the father of lies was telling the truth. All these kingdoms, all creation, all the political power. I control it all. I'm the prince of this world. And I can give that to you. If only you will worship me. I wonder how many times in various ways that temptation has come to all of us. Let me tell you how it comes to me. In a very short time, I gained notoriety in what I do. Not because I wanted it or I was clever in doing it. It just happened through the power of God. I never tried to make it happen. I certainly never told anybody what they wanted to hear in order to make it happen. And basically, day by day and moment by moment, I risk what I do by doing what I do. But if God is for you, who can be against you? Now, one time I I was preaching in Florida in the early days. I was only ordained about a year or two. And I was preaching in true Baptist style. And afterwards, an elderly Monsignor came up to me and he says, Young man, young man, you can't speak that way. That's inflammatory. And I said, Oh, Monsignor, you better believe that's inflammatory. Jesus said, I come to cast fire on the earth. And oh, how I long that it already be ignited. But what he was saying is, hey, we, Catholic priests can't talk like that. Protestants might talk like that, but you can't talk like that. That's too strong. That rocks the boat. That'll make people angry. You'll lose your position. You won't have a very long career. Make my day. I can go fishing more then. The devil holds that out to us. See, the way it is now, I've achieved, for whatever reason, a certain following. I hate that word. But in any event, I receive over 500 invitations to preach every year. I take 30 to 35. That means I turn down, how many? 15, 17 for every one I take. I can pick and choose. I can go wherever I want. And I usually can name the terms. And the devil comes to me this way. If only you'll tone it down a little bit. If only you'll watch what you say. If only you wouldn't talk about abortion. 
or artificial contraception. If only you would leave those controversial things out, why I would spread your fame from one end of the world to the other. Now, of course, the devil never comes as the devil. He comes as an angel of light. It would be prudent for you to do that, Father John. This is God speaking, <laughs> says the liar. And it would be very prudent for you to be careful. You know, be wise. Be tempered in your speech. Be like others. Don't rock the boat. Don't challenge people so much you make them uncomfortable. And if only you can learn how to do that. I, I, one time a bishop said, and he was a good bishop. I mean, I love this bishop. A very fine man. And he said to me when he first met me, I was working for him at the time. He said, now, John, I want you to be smooth. Exact word, that's a quote. Now, John, I want you to be smooth so that you might gain a constituency. Bishop. Me? Smooth? Constituency? That sounds like politics, doesn't it? Constituency, to be smooth, diplomatic. Nothing wrong with diplomacy. I'm not really a diplomat. It's good to be a diplomat. Holy Father's a diplomat. It's good. But I'm more blunt. You know, the body of Christ has many members. We're not all the same. Many people have gifts I could never have. I respect those gifts. I can't do certain things. I can tell you my mail is delivered to me in bags, sacks. Thousands and thousands of letters. If I responded to it all personally, or answered phone calls, 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, honestly, all of it's good. One out of maybe five or ten thousand pieces of correspondence might be negative. And I mean that honestly, literally. That doesn't mean that there aren't people who don't like it. There are plenty of them. But of the response that I get, it is overwhelmingly positive. How many priests get that kind of a response? Very few. And I'm not saying I'm any better than them. I'm not. I'm worse. But if a moron like me can do this, then so can anybody. Let me tell you something. Jesus rode into Jerusalem on the back of a jackass and continues to do so. <laughs> Very simple. Very simple. That's the way it is. And so, by telling the truth, by being straightforward, I don't mean to offend anybody. Actually, I'm more sensitive than the average guy. I, I'm not trying to offend anybody. I would wish never to offend anybody, honestly. You know, I talk a tough story, but no, the fact of the matter is I don't want to offend anybody. But I am not averse to offending someone if I have to in doing the job, in performing the mission. You're not going to be able to say when you stand before God, well, I didn't know. Not my fault. I'm telling you. I'm telling you the things that really matter. The devil will hold out to you the temptation of worldly goods. I am meeting with an increasing number of Catholic physicians, various places I go. They've had it up to here with the garbage in their profession, and they're banding together. They're not going to perform abortions, and they're not even going to pre prescribe birth control pills, a lot of them. In medical school, they're being coerced into doing these things and systematically rooted out if it is discovered that they are, in fact, Catholic. And what I mean by that is living their faith, putting it in action. The procedures now, I can't even talk about it. It's so distasteful. But some of the things that are going on are truly horrid. And so you have a uh, groundswell among physicians, Catholic lawyers, in every sphere of human activity. 
Listen, you don't just go to church on Sunday and live like hell on Monday. Hmm? Put your Catholic hat on on Sunday and go out and be just like the rest of the world the other six days. You can't do it. But it's comfortable to do it, isn't it? And now I don't mean you have to go preach a sermon in your workplace or your school. I don't mean that. But I do mean that you have to be rock solid in your faith and you have to have a backbone. No backbone, you won't stand. You won't stand for anything and you'll fall for everything. That's what happened. The reason the world is in a mess is because we're in a mess. The reason that the good lay faithful are in a mess is because we priests are a mess. We've lost our backbone. No more guts. The manliness has gone out of it in a false, effeminate spirit, sometimes even physical, if not emotional and spiritual, has replaced it, and we've gotten weak in the knees. And we are averse to preaching the truth in season and out of season, convenient or inconvenient, accepted or rejected. It is what it is. I hope you accept it, but if you don't, it's not going to change me one bit. The message is the same. We have to hand that message on faithfully. Salvation of our souls depends upon it. The salvation of our country depends upon it. Salvation of the world depends upon it. As we have de-Christianized society, we have dehumanized society. This used to be a very Christian country. I grew up in a very... Christian country. It was formed by Christian ideals, morals. That is not true anymore. If you don't believe it, you just think for a moment on what used to be on television compared to what is on television. You think about the crime rate then compared to now. When I was a boy, the prisons weren't full of people who were involved with drugs. Their drugs existed, illegal drugs. But it wasn't common. Now it's totally common and something like 80 to 90 percent of all criminals are in jail because of drug-related things. It's the devil's work. And I mean that literally, not figuratively. How did it happen? Because we Catholics sat back and let it happen. We're just like the rest of the neo-pagan world. We weren't strong enough in our faith to resist. How could an atrocity like abortion be the law of this great land? How is that possible with over 60 million Catholics and many other millions of good Christians in this country? How can such an atrocity such an outrage against humanity, such a holocaust. How could that be given the noble term law? Because too many of us are asleep or dead in our faith. It went from bad to worse. We had a presidential election not too long ago. Now, I don't get involved in politics, but you can't separate religion from politics. You really can't. You can in a certain way, but listen, if you're Catholic, that means you form a Catholic conscience and you vote a Catholic conscience. I would never tell you who to vote for. You can't do that. However, <laughs> a lot of you didn't vote for the, uh, the right guy, and a lot of you did vote for the right guy. You know, maybe half and half. You know who elected Clinton? The second time, Catholics. You know that? Yeah, Catholics re-elected Bill Clinton right after he refused to repeal partial birth abortion. And Bob Schieffer, the news commentator, when the election returns were coming in, was marveling at it. He said it right on television. I can't believe it. Catholics are re-electing Bill Clinton, who just refused to repeal partial birth abortion. Bob Schieffer said that. And he wasn't making religious commentary. So we had this election, and, and the country it was unheard of. We, we were, in a sense, traumatized by the whole thing. We couldn't elect the president. 
And there was rhetoric back and forth on both sides, anger, bitterness. And we could see how polarized the country was, and it went on day after day after day. Day. And then a certain woman from humble background, a Mexican woman, said to her husband, why don't we make a pilgrimage down to Mexico, to my country, down to the shrine of Our Lady of Guadalupe, and pray for our country, and pray for this presidential election. And so they went, and they prayed. And the man consecrated the presidency of the one who would win to Our Lady of Guadalupe. The man's name is Jeb Bush, the brother of the president. On December 12th, the Supreme Court decision came down. I know that because the rector of the cathedral, where Jeb Bush is a parishioner, is one of my best priest friends. When it looked hopeless, hang in there. When the devil tempts you with all the kingdoms of the world, remember that there's only one kingdom that matters. The kingdom of heaven. And when it looks like you might lose all your worldly riches because you won't go along with the program, because you won't go with the flow. Remember that dead bodies float downstream. It takes live bodies, live minds, live souls to resist the immoral currents of the times. Stand fast in your faith. Jesus responded to the temptation. You shall worship the Lord your God and him alone shall you serve. Again, he responds with the word of God. And then the devil took him to Jerusalem. And he set him on the pinnacle of the temple. And he said to him, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down from here. For it is written, he will give his angels charge of you to guard you. And on their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against the stone. Presumption. And Jesus responded to it. It is said, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. Three temptations. In these three temptations can be synthesized all temptation. Every one of us is tempted throughout the course of our life. The temptations take various forms, come in various ways. They come through people, places, and things. The word of God, rich as it is, powerful as it is, is always the response. Know it. Don't be presumptuous. Presumption is a sin against the Holy Spirit. There are two terrible sins against the Holy Spirit. Presumption and despair. I could say that we live today in our society between those radical poles of presumption and despair. They are sins against the Holy Spirit. They are sins against faith. They are sins indeed. Presumption is that sin where we imagine that we can be 
saved without grace or effort. Oh, God is good. True statement. Oh, well, God is merciful. True statement. God understands. You better believe he does. God loves you right where you're at. Absolutely certain he does. But if where you're at is sin, God doesn't love the sin that's eating you alive. Does God love you? Yes. Does God love the worst sinner in the world? Oh, yes. He does. Well, let me give you an analogy to help you understand it. If you are my beloved brother or sister, and you are, and God forbid you should contract cancer, would I stop loving you as a result of that? Certainly not. If I loved you in the first place, I would not cease loving you because of that disease. Perhaps I would love you even more. If I had the heart and mind of Christ, I would desire to alleviate your suffering. Maybe I would even somehow take it upon myself to spare you that pain. Sin is moral cancer. And it eats us alive. God doesn't stop loving the sinner. God loves the sinner. But he doesn't love the sin that's eating him away. And we have to be the same. Love the sinner. No, no, you can't hate the sinner. You've got to love every sinner because we're in the number. Love the sinner, hate the sin, the old saying. All right? Now these temptations are an illustration Jesus permitted the devil to tempt him, and he responded, giving us an example, showing us what to do. We are going to have a million and one temptations. Sometimes the greatest souls come out of the greatest temptation. Now I want you to take a look at the best friends of Jesus. Now we think about the Gospels. That's how this is revealed to us. You look at the Gospel. Let me tell you who I believe the best friends of Christ were. Well, we've got Mary Magdalene. Who did the risen Christ appear to first, according to Scripture? Mary Magdalene. Mary Magdalene was a prostitute out of whom was cast seven demons. Jesus delivered her from the power of Satan. She was the first one to see the risen Christ. She was a dear friend of the Lord Jesus Christ. She who had sinned much, had the capacity to love much. The passion that drove her the wrong way, when transformed and purified by the grace of God, that same passion drove her Drove her like the Spirit drove Jesus into the desert. Drove her the right way. Drove her to pray and do penance for all the rest of her life in the desert. One of the first of the anchoresses or hermits. And then what about Peter? Peter was one of the best friends of Jesus, right? First Pope. Peter. Insights into St. Peter. In the Garden of Gethsemane, He took out his sword and he cut off the high priest's servant's ear. My kind of God. (laughs) Well, no, not that that's so good. He, He was... Well, maybe it's good. No, he, he was a passionate man. He wanted to defend the Lord. Sure, he was a, he was human, he was weak, he was sinful. Hey, what did he do? He denied Christ three times. Right? Just like Jesus predicted he would. He, he didn't. Oh, I don't know the man. Don't know him at all. But then he went out and wept bitterly. Peter was one of the best friends of Christ. A passionate man, a sinful man. What about James and John? They were the other two best friends of Jesus. Remember what happened when they were going through Samaritan territory and they wanted hospitality from the Samaritans and they wouldn't give it to them? Samaritans wouldn't give a Jew hospitality. They were 
our enemies in religion. And what did James and John say? Well, Lord, let's call down lightning and wipe them out. He called in their strike. <laughs> wow, send some napalm down, Lord. We'll wipe that rotten Samaritan village out. They won't give us hospitality. Well, give them what fur. <laughs> and Jesus called them Bonarges, sons of thunder. You see? Mary Magdalene, Peter, James, and John. Really the closest friends of Jesus, as far as we can tell, from the gospel. Passionate people, sinful people, people who went the wrong way for a while, but people who were drawn to Christ. He didn't reject them. He loved them. He didn't say, oh, you're a terrible sinner. You're not good enough to be in my company. No, he welcomed them with open arms. Jesus, the divine physician, said, it's a sick man who requires a physician, not a well man. I have come for sinners, not for the self-righteous, the Lord says. And that's good news for us, because to one degree or another, we're all sinners. And so then the devil defeated, left him. It says, the devil departed from him until an opportune time. Until an opportune time. Now there's the story of our life. You fight it out. You overcome temptation. And the devil will depart until an opportune time. Time. In other words, he'll come back and try again. All my life, from my teens until I was 37 years old, say 20 years, from 17 to 37, I was plagued by many of the same demons that plague our society today. Lust, substance abuse, whether alcohol or drugs, lust for power. You know, you want to be looked up to. You want to be in the driver's seat. You want to be able to tell what people what to do. You know, the soap opera of politics, especially the unhappy spectacle that we're seeing of the last presidency. And I do not condemn poor Clinton. I, I don't normally don't mention names, but you know who I'm talking about anyway, so. But I, I, I don't. I'm not down on him. I don't hate him. I, you know, in him I see so much of our society. It, it, he's like the personification. It's a monster we've created. Clinton's no different than a million other people, maybe me. But it's a sorry testimony to what's happened to our great country. But it can become great again, and it will become great again if enough of us will pray. And if enough of us will resist the temptation. Temptation of what? Hey, temptation to cheat on anything. Temptation to, oh, just throw in the towel and give up, you know. Oh, the stress is getting to me. I can't take this. These people are rotten. Why bother? The harder I try, the worse it gets. Let me get drunk. Really? And then what happens? It gets worse than it was in the beginning. You get depressed. And the depression on top of the problem you already had is magnified. And you know what the end of it all is? Do you know why the devil is behind that? He wants you dead. Even physically, but especially morally. How many times I've come close to death, I can't count them. How many times I could have ended up dead in a drug house or in prison or in some God-forsaken gutter. I can't hardly believe it. When I look back on it, I, the first time I did my personal testimony in in Florida, an old Monsignor came up to me shaking and he said, oh, 
Oh, young man, young man, that's an amazing story. But is it true? <laughs> I said, Monsignor, if it happened. If that hadn't happened to me, I'd have a hard time believing it, too. But it's absolutely true. I, I marvel at it. You know, I, I, the great statesman Conrad Adenauer said, God has placed obvious limitations on our intelligence, but none whatsoever on our stupidity. <laughs> I'm living proof of that pithy saying. And you marvel at it. How did I do that? Why would I ever do that? And you know what? It ain't over till it's over. Hey, right, I had a conversion, right? Came back to the church, was ordained a priest, even by the Pope. Wow. And then went on to preach. I preached to other people. I live in fear, just like St. Paul. I fear that having preached to others, I myself might be lost. Why? Because I have not arrived yet. I have not arrived. You know when you arrive? When you get in heaven. Anything can happen until then. And so what we need to do is remain humble. Remain humble. Work out our salvation. Trust God. Be confident in his goodness. But hey, you know what? If left up to me, I will dive head first into hell. No question about it. It's only the mercy of God, the providence of our Lord and our Blessed Mother's care, the angels. We have great help in the angels. I talk about the devils, I'll tell you what. Angels. Good angels. Every one of us have one. Do you know that? You have an angel, a guardian angel. That's not some mere myth, you know. That's church teaching. That's church teaching. Every one of us has a guardian angel. Remember the movie Star Wars, R2-D2? The little robots? And those robots, boy, they were really smart and they could run the spaceship and all kind of stuff. Well, we got something way better than that. We each have a guardian angel. And that guardian angel was assigned to us. And from the moment of conception, all the way through our life, what's his job? Well, guard, yes, to guard us, but to get us to heaven. Mine, should he ever accomplish the mission, will be the most highly decorated angel. <laughs> In the history of heaven, God will give him all the medals, sign over half the kingdom to him probably. He said, wow, you put up with that. But that's what the angels do. St. Michael, the very word, Michael in Hebrew, he's the, he's the, the angel, the power of God. He's the protector of God's people. He's the kind of military one. He's the one who combats the devil head to head. St. Michael. I tell you, St. Michael literally has saved me on more than one occasion. Literally. Saved my life. St. Gabriel, the angel of the incarnation, the one who came to comfort our Lord in the Garden of Gethsemane. St. Raphael, the healing power of God. Remember from the book of Tobit, how he went to battle 
with the evil spirit in one the battle protecting his charge have devotion for the angels we have feast day for them you know we have a feast day for the holy angels uh, for Michael Gabriel for the archangels Rachel and also for the guardian angels we've got two feast days in our, at the end of September right September 29th and then the guardian angels I believe it's October 2nd and so do you talk to your guardian angel? You should. You ask him for things. You ask him to help you. You ask him to help your children, your grandchildren. Do it. We've got a powerful helper. Do that. Now, you know, I know that in a lot of circles, I would be considered silly uh, to talk about such things. <clears throat> I understand that. I, I accept that. One time when I finished my doctorate degree in theology, uh, someone who was somewhat educated, came up to me and said, Father, at what level do you teach? Assuming that I, I taught doctoral candidates or seminarians or university, whatever, graduate school. And I said, well, I teach kindergarten. <laughs> he said, but you have five university degrees. You graduated top honors and everything. And, you know, surely you have a position in a major university. Nope. I teach kindergarten. And as one rather well-known liberal theologian had it after reviewing my course on the Catechism of the Catholic Church, he concluded, this man is a simpleton. And I took it as a compliment. Because if you know theology, you know that God by definition is pure simplicity. Perhaps a simpleton is one who follows the simple God. I don't know, but I know this. Our business is to teach the simple truth simply. Our business is to not take the simple truth and render it incomprehensible. The great Archbishop Fulton Sheen used to say, sometimes we educators, theologians, philosophers, teachers, we think that our business is to, is to take a simple thing and, and render it nearly unintelligible so that people will say, wow, how smart he is. <laughs> if he understands that, he must be smart. <laughs> Bishop Sheen gave a lecture in England one time to a class of deacons uh, on theandric actions, that word I said before, the action of the God-man, Jesus Christ. And Bishop Sheen, of course, was a very erudite man, and he was a wonderful orator, tremendous, also a great holy man whose cause for canonization has been introduced. But Bishop Sheen held forth, and one of the British deacons came up to him after, and he said, Ah, oh, Dr. Sheen, positively brilliant, Positively brilliant. Bishop Sheen said, oh really, what did I say? And he said, well, I don't quite know. And Bishop Sheen said, neither do I. And he made a vow then that he would never try to take a simple thing and render it complicated. And we shouldn't do that either. Parents, teachers, religious sisters, priests, we should all take the simple faith, the simple truth, and teach it simply. In that way, among other ways, we will be doing battle with the enemy of souls. Yes, we'll be tempted in many different ways at many different times. But if we stay firmly rooted in Christ, the Word of God, we'll be able to deal with all that temptation, and that temptation will become a vehicle that propels us into sanctity, that propels us into heaven. God bless you.